Thanks everybody for attending a new Bytes of Innovation webinar. My name is Martin Willemink. I'm one of the co-founders at SecMed. Um, Bytes of Innovation is a webinar which provides a deep dive into the future of medicine. And we do this with renowned experts such as researchers, physicians, investors, and lawyers. We do it every other Thursday. So we have one today, we'll have one in two weeks, and so on. And the concept is as follows. A presentation of 15 minutes by the expert, followed by Q&A, which uh, this, today we have a very special Bytes of Innovation because Shen Wang from SecMed is actually co-moderating with me the Q&A session instead of Aline Lutz, who usually does it, but she has a vacation today. Um, so thanks, Shen, for, for doing this. Uh, and I will also be, of course, uh, moderating the Q&A session. So to all the participants, uh, all the attendants here, make sure to put your questions in the chat box so that we can discuss them during the Q&A phase of the, uh, of the webinar. Um, today, I'm proud to announce that we have Franz Prister amongst us. He completed medical school and a master's in data science and an MBA. He's a true rock star. And he did all of this in Munich in Germany. He's a co-founder of multiple startups. And in 2019, he co-founded DeepSea as the CEO. And at DeepSea, they develop a cutting edge AI platform that integrates medical imaging AI products into the clinical workflow. Franz has a special interest in AI, in data, healthcare digitization, clinical research, and patient care. And today, Franz is gonna talk about radiology AI from data to clinical impact. Franz, the floor is yours. Thanks so much, Martin. Uh, thanks so much, Shen, uh, as well. Uh, let me share my screen. Yeah, we can see it. Go Super ahead. Super cool. Thanks so much for the invitation uh, to uh, this webinar series. I'm really honored to be here tonight. Uh, for me tonight, for you, it's morning. Uh, so we are based in Munich, Germany. Uh, so it's 6 p.m. here. Um, today, I'm going to talk about radiology AI from data to clinical impact. Um, as uh, you already introduced me uh, perfectly, my name is Franz. I'm the CEO and one of the co-founders of our company, DeepSea. And um, I will uh, take you on a brief journey today. Um, so let's first have the big picture in mind, um, uh, looking at radiology. Um, a lot of innovation has happened in that field up to the uh, year 1972, which was uh, the integration um, of uh, the first PACs uh, into, the, uh, into the radiology department. Um, ever since, uh, for the last 50 years, uh, not so much has happened, only incremental innovation. But um, just recently, uh, we uh, witnessed um, a new innovation in that field, which is deep learning and AI. So um, this was just a couple of years back, uh, around 2015, um, that um, AI really uh, got introduced in the field of medical imaging. Uh, we believe this is a real breakthrough innovation um, and will transform uh, the radiology field. Uh, some experts in the field have been a little bit over enthusiastic possibly. Um, and uh, one of those was Jeffrey Hinton, one of the godfathers of modern AI, like in deep learning, many of you know that quote. Um, he said that we should stop training radiologists now because AI will be so um, superior compared to radiologists that you don't need a radiologist anymore. This was in 2016. Um, he uh, said that uh, this will be the case in five years. Uh, he was not right. Um, and the situation uh, is actually quite different. We disagree strongly with the statement that he made back then because the situation in the field, if you look at the facts, uh, is like this radiology is heavily under pressure. Uh, and experiencing a huge demand supply gap challenge. Uh, so um, there is a huge workload increase over the last 10 years, uh, facing um, only a very slight increase in the number of radiologists. And this is European numbers. Um, in the UK, for example, it's even worse. Um, and in the US, I think the, uh, the number of rats is kind of stable. So um, we see that there are a lot of downstream challenges um, that are caused by this situation, like physician burnout, senior positions being unfilled, uh, also uh, working under time pressure can increase, um, can mean an increase in error rates. Um, and we believe that AI can be um, a measure to actually fill that demand supply gap. And it's going to be the key to fill that demand supply gap. And in this brief talk, I want to cover the question, how can we come from data um, to actual meaningful, clinically meaningful AI solutions? And I'll take you on a very brief history ride uh, through um, the history of uh, medical imaging AI, which is 
um, shorter than uh, 10 years at this point in time, um, where we explore how we get from data to actual real clinical impact. And we start uh, with um, the um, sharing of data, uh, which is kind of the ingredient for uh, training AI algorithms. Uh, then I'm going to talk briefly about AI algorithms and um, about products and solutions and how we get to clinical impact. I've picked um, one very tangible example um, to take you on this journey uh, uh, so that you can visualize and imagine uh, a little bit better. Um, this is uh, the example of chest x-ray exams, a very common exam um, that is taken um, uh, thousands of times um, each day uh, all around the globe. And um, in uh, this example, we start with the data piece. So first of all, um, I want to explain a little bit why we need data. Many of you might know, but this is like a super quick recap uh, about supervised learning. And many of the AI and deep learning algorithms are supervised learning algorithms. Uh, so what we do in supervised learning is essentially um, getting from data um, images, for example, uh, in this case, uh, images of cats and dogs to a descriptor, uh, which is a variable called y. Um, in, this uh, in this case, it would be uh, labels um, that describe if um, you see a cat or a dog. So what you would do in supervised learning is taking both of it um, and trying to model this unknown relationship between the data and those descriptors um, and train an algorithm with both of it, uh, with the data and with those labels to at some point be able um, independently um, to uh, predict just based on the data without the labels, uh, the respective labels. So in order to come to that point, you need a lot of data, which is labeled. Um, and uh, this is uh, also um, accelerated by the fact uh, that uh, deep neural network architectures uh, that are now pretty common and super powerful need lots of data to be trained on. Um, and um, we, um, in this first chapter, we will focus a little bit on um, the need for data. So there are a couple of things that you need to consider uh, when you look at uh, the training data. Um, I mentioned already that you need labeled data, um, and um, this can cause a challenge. For example, data quality can be a real issue. And I um, uh, brought up this uh, blog post from uh, Lauren Optenrena, a radiologist from Australia, who um, had uh, contributed a really good blog post highlighting some challenges with open source data sets. Uh, like this uh, example is the chest X-ray 14 data set, where she uh, claims that um, many of those um, data pieces, data assets, are labeled incorrectly. And of course, this can pose a major challenge um, if you want to train um, and validate your AI algorithms. And um, this can be a challenge in many open source data sets. Uh, of course, uh, there are other challenges that you need to address, like data privacy issues, data ownership, data licensing issues, uh, especially with open source data sets. Um, but um, there are a lot of other challenges that need to be addressed when you want to access data for training your AI algorithms. And there is this paper, uh, which was um, published um, by one of our co-hosts, Martin, um, two years ago, which I really like. Um, it highlights all the different steps that are necessary to get to uh, data assets um, that can be used for proper AI training and validation. So it includes ethical approval, uh, and I added patient consent because I come from Europe, um, and this is super important, in particular here in, uh, in, in Europe with GDPR, um, then data access, querying the data, finding the right data assets, uh, then de-identifying the data, transferring the data, um, having a quality control mechanism, and then structuring and labeling the data. So this is obviously a lot of effort, and you need to put a lot of resources into this. Um, and um, there are a lot of companies now out there um, that have uh, made a business out of this. Uh, one uh, is co-host uh, tonight, uh, which is Segment, uh, doing a fantastic job for a couple of years now. I put another example of a company from uh, Germany uh, called M3i. They're also really focusing on covering that whole value chain from identifying the right uh, data assets up to making it available for AI research uh, and development. So once you've covered this first step, um, it goes to AI algorithmic training. Um, and I don't want to spend too much time on it. Um, I um, think um, uh, the great advances and breakthroughs um, in that space have been made between the years 2014 and 2017, approximately. 
Um, most of those um, training algorithms are uh, convolutional neural networks, uh, where you would uh, feed the network uh, with training data, labeled training data, and then uh, try to model this relationship, and in the end, being able to uh, predict certain classes. And um, you have um, experienced, or we have experienced in the last couple of years, um, many different um, methodological approaches. Um, many challenges have been overcome over the last couple of years, like generalizability challenges, um, advancing the methods uh, in deep learning, and also uh, excelling the performance such that uh, this could be used at some point in a clinical setup. Um, and um, I think we have overcome those technical challenges quite well. Um, but um, an AI algorithm which has been trained in the lab is not yet a product. And I think this is a point that I want to make, um, that um, you need to fulfill certain criteria and go through a specific process to get from an algorithm to an AI product. In essence, what you could say is that an AI product are, um, or is an AI algorithm that needs to be cleared as a medical device. So software is also a medical device, and there are many steps that you need to go through. Um, some of them I listed uh, on the right side of the chart, uh, which is risk assessment, um, technical documentation, technical and clinical validation of the algorithm, and regulatory clearance with the uh, uh, bodies. Um, in uh, the US, it's the FDA, and uh, in Europe, it's the notified bodies for the CE marking. And uh, after this, you don't stop. Uh, you also have some duties as a manufacturer and vendor um, to do post-market surveillance after you have introduced your product into the market. And uh, on the left side, you see one of those rigorous um, evaluation papers, which was published um, in Lancet uh, for a product uh, from an Australian company called Annalise, uh, really a breakthrough paper, which showed uh, the clinical um, benefit and the clinical validation of the algorithm uh, when used um, in the wilderness. And this was part of, um, the, um, of this whole process. And I think it's very important to understand that getting from an algorithm which performs well in the lab to an actual product costs a lot of money and resources. And it's a very tedious process where um, AI vendors put a lot of effort. So um, there have been um, tons of algorithms coming to the market. So we, are, uh, we have already kind of passed that stage of uh, mass um, algorithmic uh, clearance um, in the US, but also uh, in, in Europe. And more and more algorithms come now to the market, having run through that process, which takes uh, up to three years. So um, after we have arrived at the AI product, uh, let's look at the next step. Um, how um, can you use this product? And uh, many of the vendors have gone a step further uh, to create real tangible workflow value. A product, just the algorithm being certified, might not be enough um, to really satisfy the needs of the end users. So uh, many of the uh, different vendors have created interfaces uh, where uh, user interfaces where the user can interact uh, with the software uh, to give feedback, to accept findings, um, to see visualizations uh, of the outputs, etc. Uh, and this is a great um, step into the right direction. However, what we see in clinical practice, especially in uh, Europe, that's our home market, um, is that um, the workflow integration today is not yet harmonized and the scalability of the AI value delivery is therefore kind of limited. You have, of course, the existing PACs and risk infrastructure that every radiologist is working with. Um, and then for each and every algorithm um, that a, a radiologist wants to use, you have a specific AI vendor interface. And this is cool if you only use one um, algorithm, uh, but one algorithm would only cover a small percentage um, of all your caseload, so to speak. Um, and that means that you are having the option to switch between different vendor um, interfaces and this switch uh, between different applications like your existing applications and maybe different vendor interfaces causes a lot of friction in the workflow. And uh, we have um, understood that challenge um, and uh, have um, with our company DeepC come up with a solution for this. Um, our product is DeepC OS. It's an AI operating system having a lot of different product features um, that, uh, addresses, um, that address clinical needs, but also the needs of the um, IT and AI companies. And with DeepCOS, we um, have um, this functionality to harmonize this workflow integration and make the AI value delivery super scalable. How do we do that? We have an SDK-based integration approach 
where vendors would only need to integrate with us once. And then on the other hand, we integrate um, deeply with the existing applications. For example, PAX companies, risk companies, or also reporting companies or any other um, kind of application uh, company that uh, would somehow benefit from the usage of AI. And we do this in a way that we deeply integrate with those um, AI, uh, sorry, with those IT applications like PAX, for example, and uh, fully um, deliver this value that AI uh, can uh, deliver in a super seamless and smooth way for the user. And of course, for the companies, um, it's uh, super interesting as well, uh, because uh, this makes uh, the adoption super scalable. So smooth and seamless integration into the workflows and then, of course, a re relevant percentage coverage of cases uh, because you can integrate different algorithms into the same workflow and uh, really prove the clinical value creation. So um, that's the uh, last step that you see now. Now we are really um, able to create clinical impact and clinical value by having a, a super smooth workflow integration. And I just wanna give you one example of many amazing papers um, the partners of ours uh, have published in the last couple of years. And uh, this has mainly happened in the last, I would say two to three years that companies have really uh, shown evidence of the clinical impact that their products and solutions uh, would have. And uh, one of them is our partner company Lunit. Um, and they show uh, with their uh, chest X-ray algorithm uh, CXR um, benefits on two ends. One is the quality um, end, um, where they show that the detection rates um, of critical and urgent findings uh, goes tremendously up uh, while using this algorithm in clinical practice. And on the other hand, the reading time uh, can significantly go down, translating into efficiency gains. And the smooth integration of those great products into the workflows is super crucial to really unlock this uh, value. Uh, so um, let's recap. Um, that was a very brief history uh, between 2014, 2015, up to 2022, um, where we have uh, already today seen um, several stages uh, of evolution, like getting from data to algorithms, uh, so overcoming those algorithmic challenges, uh, turning algorithms into products, now uh, turning the products into workflow solutions, and then really unlocking the clinical impact and the clinical value. So I hope this was interesting. Uh, I thank you very much for your attention. If you have questions about uh, the talk or about our company, uh, feel free to type in the chat or also reach out to me later. I'm very happy to uh, engage in the discussion. Thanks. Thank you so much, Franz. <clears throat> I have a quick question for you, um, if you don't mind, after your talk. So. Uh, your deep sea OS is very, very fascinating. So I was just wondering, can a provider choose between any of the AI algorithms that you guys are able to partner with and deploy within their institution? For example, can they choose two out of your eight partners or can they choose four out of eight? And would that all be deployed the same way? Um, yes. So um, very good question, Shen. Um, that's exactly how it works. Um, of course, we have a uh, clinical value consulting component um, to our offering uh, towards the clinical customers, where we will also advise them uh, what algorithms might suit their workflows best. But in uh, general, uh, apart from that bundling approach, where we would, for example, uh, in an emergency radiology department, offer emergency uh, algorithms, uh, apart from the bundling approach, the customer has full flexibility on choosing uh, which algorithms they want to integrate into their workflows, and we make it happen in a streamlined fashion. Awesome. That's uh, You guys are developing a great product there, Franz. It's really cool. And uh, thanks for this presentation, by the way. It was really smooth, and it looked like... Did you have a like a graphic designer look at the, the, the slides or something? Because it looked very, very, very good. Uh, Thanks so much for the feedback. Uh, our designer is on vacation, <laughs> but he did some pre-work uh, with some templates. Uh, so nice, nice. That's great. awesome. Um, a question about the, um, in the beginning, you said you talked about meaningful clinical AI applications. How do you determine what is a meaningful application? Yeah. Like, what do you look at? Yeah, so that's a super good question. So um, for an AI algorithm to be meaningful, we always look at the value it can potentially create in the workflow. So especially in the beginning of this journey, uh, we've seen a lot of algorithms that 
uh, just come to the market for the sake of being a cool technology product, but uh, there is no real need in the market or no real uh, clinical issue that uh, can be addressed. Um, but um, that has changed dramatically. Also, the vendors uh, really have shown a lot of clinical evidence, and uh, we are um, seeing clinical evidence in many different aspects. Uh, but one, uh, sorry, two, um, two main uh, trends that we see is um, improving the quality of care, which can have different dimensions. Uh, and on the other hand, um, like creating a return on investment uh, case uh, and an efficiency case. Yeah. And it really depends on the, on the institution, to be fair, uh, which algorithm suits best. That's why we have this clinical value consulting component in our approach as well. Perfect. Yeah, that totally makes sense. I'm uh, I'm looking at the uh, and I, I totally agree. Yeah, there there's different approaches, different things that you need to look at, of course, to determine whether something is uh, applicable. You see a lot in the research setting, people just have a certain data set, and then they're like, okay, I have this data, so I need to do something with it, and it's not necessarily like the biggest clinical impact. And I think it's good if you're developing products. Of course, you really need to think about okay, what's the yeah. impact of this product going to be in the clinical setting, and is it going to decrease that gap between the demand that's increasing so much and uh, and the number of radiologists that's not necessarily increasing indeed um, so i totally agree i see that uh, akemi uh, asked a question in the chat box um why do you think there's such a big quality gap between open source data sets and more privatized data sets yeah that's a very good question so i have a theory uh which which might be true um but i think um if you look at it um also you guys at segment uh, can really tell uh, many stories about this um really preparing the data in includes many different steps uh for example uh data uh, structuring data selection uh data transfer data quality control etc and this is um, a process which is quite resource intense there's work associated with that process and if you look at the uh, um, open data sets uh, some of them are kind of structured but many of them um, are uh, using um, uh, none of those methods basically and i believe and that's my theory um, there are simply resource constraints to go through um, that whole process uh, with those uh, large data sets like for example this chest x-ray data set i think it consists of hundreds of thousands of images so there would be a huge price tag to uh, really prepare this data in such a uh, high quality way. So I think that's that's one of the main reasons. But probably a question that you can answer best, uh, Martin Chen. <laughs> it's always good to hear it from uh, from somebody else, from like a, an external perspective. <laughs> so that was good. not paid for the sales pitch. <laughs> <laughs> no, we should have paid you more than you could have. No. Um, so I see there's another question from Arvind. Uh, what's the best way to integrate AI into the clinical workflow? Mm -hmm. That's also a very good question. It depends a little bit on the user, but um, from our uh, experience over the last couple of years, uh, the best way to integrate it is um, to integrate it into the existing interfaces that the users are already, um, are already familiar with. That means that uh, on the one hand, you use um, DICOM interfaces, for example, to transmit the data and display it in the, in the PAX viewer workstation. But then on top of that, uh, you have a deeper integration. And that's what we do with our platform and with DeepCOS uh, with the respective um, workstation providers, such that you, for, for example, would already see a preview of the results in the work list. Uh, you get notifications, et cetera, et cetera. Thank you. And we have one more question here in the chat, Franz, um, from Darcy. There are many medical AI algorithms developed in the research setting. Why do you think most of these don't make it into a product? Yeah, also super good question. Uh, I see two main reasons. Um, I think the first one is uh, the validation piece, which goes uh, hand in hand with generalizability uh, challenges. So you really need to uh, develop your algorithms on um, very heterogeneous data sets uh, with data from different sources because every scanner is a little bit different. And what we see uh, most often in research settings is that uh, a group is taking data from one or a couple of centers. But then when you take the algorithm to uh, uh, external center, um, it wouldn't generalize and the performance would drop dramatically. 
So that's one reason. Um, I think it's a lack of uh, diverse data. Uh, and the second reason is uh, that this whole process from getting uh, uh, of getting from an AI algorithm to a product with all the medical device clearance and regulatory approval, etc. It's very resource intense. So we um, see uh, a cost or price tag of two to three million dollars uh, associated with this, with clinical validation studies, etc. And often research institutions cannot or do not want to afford and take the risk. Yeah. Yeah, that totally makes sense. I think uh, I wrote down some I, myself, like generalizability as the number one indeed. And then you have the whole process of making the product. I, I totally agree with uh, uh, with what you're saying there. So I think we're at the, uh, there are more questions, but we, you know, at some point we have to say we're, we're there. So uh, you were one of the few people that actually gave a 15 minute presentation and then we actually had quite some time for the Q&A. So that, that was great. It was a very interesting presentation, uh, Franz. Thank, thanks for your uh, contribution. Uh, I really enjoyed it, and uh, we had nice uh, interaction with the um, with the attendants. So thanks everybody for attending. Um, in two weeks, we will have uh, Marcel Wassink. He's a serial entrepreneur, um, and he's going to talk about his experience launching multiple startups in the medical space, um, especially medical tech space. So that's going to be a very interesting one. So I hope to see you all in two weeks. And Franz, thanks again for an excellent presentation. Thanks so much to everyone, Martin, Chen, especially, and the attendance uh, for uh, this cool session. Thanks.